So um, our first presenter today um, is a gentleman who, who uh, certainly needs no introduction if you've, uh, if you've attended this conference over the last five or six years. I think, I think we've had Sam Shannon present. Uh, like he's been coming every year. He does such a great job. And we're, we're pleased to uh, have him back uh, again this year. Dr. Sam Shannon is president and chief economist of Shannon Economics and an adjunct professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Noted economist and active commentator on issues of national and global economic significance. Dr. Channon is amongst the commercial real estate industry's leading voices in relation to capital and credit markets and the dynamic relationship between the economy, regulation, and market performance. Dr. Channon received his PhD in applied economics from the Wharton School and was a doctoral scholar at Princeton University. In addition to his current teaching in the fields of public policy and real estate finance at Wharton, he has served as a visiting professor in the economics department at Dartmouth College. Sam's topic today is the state of the Florida economy, and I'd ask you to give Sam a warm welcome. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I, I have to tell you that uh, I feel very privileged to have been invited uh, again uh, to join you at this conference. It's been a great experience for me over the last couple of years to get to know uh, a whole group of students who you know, have subsequently gone on to work in all sorts of different areas of the profession to be able to stay in touch with them um, and to, to get to know so many people uh, who attend the conference every year. It really is a, a privilege for me and I appreciate it very much to Professor Ling and Archer everyone who is uh, involved in the center and all the alumni who make the work of the center possible. Um, it really is a, a very, uh, very special place and, uh, and I appreciate the invitation to be here with you again. Um, I made a claim last year uh, in that regard and it turns out not a lot of people believe the claim that I made. Uh, so I brought some evidence with me this time around um, and I'm just going to touch on this very briefly uh, only because the subject of the textbook has already come up today. Um, but if we uh, take a look over here, can, I, I pulled this off of a, an interview I had done a, a couple of weeks ago. The camera team had come to my office. I was too busy to go to their studio. There's a gator connection in this photograph. Do you see it? If you can't see it in this photograph, uh, do you see it in this one? <laughs> if you can't see it in this one, I'll help you out. I told you last year, that I keep a copy of Ling and Archer on my desk. <laughs> and I was not kidding. I have had a copy of Ling and Archer since I was an undergrad. That book goes with me everywhere and I have been very, very well served by it. Uh, we're all very, very lucky uh, to be in a position to work with two people that I can tell you with one foot in academia and one foot in the private sector um, are, are really sort of you know, people of stature and significance and visibility, uh, the heavyweights so to speak, of, uh, of commercial real estate uh, research uh, uh, for our generation. Now, I, I want to then jump into uh, the discussion of what's happening with the Florida economy. And I want to start uh, by uh, leaving you, uh, or kicking you off with a thought. All of this has happened before, and all of it will happen again. Um, if you can't place the line, it's uh, from the beginning of Peter Pan. And it's going to end up being relevant to our conversation today. So keep it in mind, it's happened before, and it's going to happen again. Let's start then by talking a little bit about how people have characterized uh, what's happened in the housing market in Florida over the course of the last couple of years. How people sort of characterized, described, uh, tried to make sense of the boom, the bust that has followed, and uh, the relatively modest recovery that we've experienced in the years that have followed. Well, first we started with that big uptick. Miami, Miami Beach, Coral Gables, uh, the East Coast as far as Palm Beach, all struck by a real estate boom. Um, the assets are rising in value, um, and people are making a lot of money. You know what? You're able to make a handsome profit more than you know, you'd be able to make by setting aside some money in your 401k. You might be an individual investor. You can buy real estate. It's not only a place to live, it's a vehicle for wealth creation. Everyone is getting involved in real estate in Florida. So we've got handsome profits being made, and all of a sudden, this sometimes happens in markets. Not only are we all making a lot of money in the game of real estate, but at some point, there's so much momentum, there's so much excitement, that why prices are going up 
ceases to be as relevant or as pertinent or as oft discussed an issue as the fact that they are going up. That becomes sort of the story in and of itself. The momentum and pricing in the asset market and the investment flows takes on a life of its own. And you have a bubble. What happens after that? The bubble collapses. And at least in this case, monetary policymakers have come to the rescue. So what have they done? They worked and pulled all sorts of levers, some that uh, we knew they had access to and some that have been astonishing. Uh, but they've uh, engaged in traditional monetary policy, experimental monetary policy, um, and uh, they've done all of this out of a desire to keep interest rates low. And that's helped so many people in, a, in an incredible array of different ways. Uh, the fact that capital is available at low cost, provided you can qualify for it, provided you can access the capital market, has meant that you may want to engage in an acquisition, you may want to buy real estate, you're able to finance that at a fairly low cost. It's been defining when we think about how it is that we have dealt with the potential crisis with regard to distressed real estate. If you're a distressed investor, this might have been a source of frustration for you. But if you look at how it is that we have actually dealt with the crisis of looming maturities, of loans that you know, were over leveraged and would never be able to meet current underwriting criteria, we haven't written down balances on a lot of these loans. Invariably, what banks, what special servicers have been able to do is to say, you know what, you're not able to, you're not able to make your payments, but your interest rate is six and a half percent, and I can put you into a loan. I can modify this structure. So you know what, in this environment where treasuries are yielding 1.7, I can make you a loan of three or four percent, and you're suddenly going to be able to meet your principal uh, interest obligation. It's uh, been uh, an incredible influence not only in sort of the broader economy, the arena of the Federal Reserve, when we're thinking about sort of the grand ambitions of monetary policymakers and what it is that they're trying to achieve in encouraging economic activity. Well, commercial real estate is you know, peripheral to the things that they're thinking about, uh, but it's had a profound influence on outcomes in our industry over the course of the last couple of years. What I'm going to suggest a little bit later on is that some of those things have been good. We have benefited tremendously from low interest rates. There are segments of the market where an abundance of capital at very, very low cost for a significant period of time uh, ultimately uh, introduces distortions to the way that we think about the prices of assets. And that becomes a problem. It requires that for all of the enthusiasm that is well deserved when we think about how it is that our markets are starting to recover, uh, we also have to be very, very cautious. Because monetary policy, as it's being undertaken today, you know, there are some, you know, there is some peripheral damage. There are going to be some casualties. It's a very blunt instrument. And some of the things that it's doing, some of the influence that it's exerting in commercial real estate markets, it's not all good. So we've got monetary policymakers that, you know, at least on a grand stage, you know, they're working to get markets going again. They're working to make sure that there's enough capital out there that the absence of credit, your inability to finance, that in itself should not be the thing that exerts significant downward pressure on assets. We know that when capital is available, it can help prices to go up, but when capital disappears and flows out of the market, uh, you can't refinance, you can't get a new loan to engage in a new acquisition. Price discovery starts to weaken. All of those things undermine the value of assets. We need to put a floor under the value of assets to you know, really to help the market to find its foot again. So we've got policymakers that are doing all kinds of astonishing things. And uh, it doesn't come as a surprise that one of the ways in which that's been characterized, because the meanings of their action uh, are not understood by the great majority of people, they can reasonably be assumed to have superior wisdom. There are a lot of folks out there who think, you know what, the Fed knows what it's doing. Basic assumption, that's probably reasonable. Do they know exactly what they're doing? Do they have perfect control over things like inflation, over exactly what will happen in the long end of the treasury curve? They don't. But we assume that, you know what, these are some smart guys. Um, Janet Yellen, uh, who was uh, president of the San Francisco Fed and is now vice chairman of the, uh, of the Federal Reserve Board, means that it's not just uh, a bunch of very smart guys. Um, we have then a situation where you know, there's a lot going on in monetary policy. We've got a lot of people, you can read the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, you can read the minutes that come out of the Fed. There's a whole business, there's a whole industry uh, where people you know, their only job is to interpret comments that are being made by Chairman Bernanke, that are being made by the individual Fed presidents when they give uh, their speeches around the country in between the, 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 the policy meetings. 
So the actions are going to be criticized sometimes. They'll be scrutinized for hidden meaning. And that's where, I mean, Fed speak is an industry into itself. What did they really mean? Um, but that's the mystique of central bank. So monetary policy makers have played a role. Challenge for a lot of people is that if you invest in treasuries, you may be highly averse to risk right now. You may not want to take a lot of chances. Think about this in 2009, 2010. The idea of investing in risky assets, well, your risk tolerance is pretty low. And so you want to be somewhere safe. Well, what does that mean for us in 2009, 2010? It means that with these incredibly low yields in the treasury market, although we may want to engage in a flight to safety, if we actually store our money in cash or in treasuries or in some other fungible instrument, then it's actually going to decline in value. After you account for inflation, your yield on the treasury is negative. It's not a normal world that we're in today. It's a world where people are nervous enough in different parts of the world and different economies and different geopolitical settings that they're ready to buy treasuries even though the return is negative. From their perspective, they're paying the treasury a nominal fee to preserve the vast majority of the value of their capital. And you know what? They might be able to buy an asset that yields a little bit more in their own economy, it's denominated in euros, whatever it may be. But there's risk there, and they're willing to pay for that risk to go away. And so we can have these negative yields in the treasury market. Problem is for your pension fund, if you're an investor that has some kind of target yield, that's just not going to work for you. You've got to find an asset that you can invest in uh, that's going to offer some return. We're not going to take lots of chances. We want to find some kind of happy medium. What isn't uh, as low yielding as treasuries, but at the same time isn't so risky uh, that all of my investors are going to get pretty uncomfortable with what I'm doing. So we've seen money flow into stock markets. Uh, Dow Jones Industrial Average, at least last week, uh, having hit its uh, highest level since before the recession, at least one of the indices uh, hit its all-time high. You contrast that with uh, the sort of more mixed discussion that we'll have around what's happening in the real economy. What's happening with corporate profits? What's happening in the labor market? How confident do we feel about the kind of growth that we'll experience in the United States over the course of the next couple of years? If you think it is appropriate for the Federal Reserve to be as interventionist as it is being today, then by definition, you've already conceded that our economy is not performing on its own. It needs help. Otherwise, we wouldn't be taking all of the chances and risks and incurring the potential costs associated with the way that we're conducting monetary policy today. So money has to flow into other things. It flows into blue chip stocks. We'll buy Google, we'll buy Apple, whatever it is. We'll buy commercial real estate. And these markets you know, see a lot of capital flowing in. Um, and part of what drives up the prices, part of why the stock markets are rising, is because there is a lot of capital flowing. There's a finite number of stocks uh, and a larger number of dollars chasing after each of those each of those stock units. So the price goes up a little bit. At the same time, though, I mean, a lot of people are making money in the stock market. If any one of us in this room has a portfolio where we saw whether it's you know, uh, an investable portfolio, or whether it's our, our retirement uh, account, you know, between 2008 and 2010, there were some, were some pretty scary years when we were thinking about whether or not we were going to be able to retire because there was so much value lost in our savings. Some of that savings, we were thinking about in terms of you know, the equity in our homes. That equity, that growth in that equity is something that allowed us to save less over the course of a couple of years. Maybe make smaller contributions to our 401k, because you know what, the value of my home is going up all the time, and as far as I've heard, it can't go down. So I've got this sort of you know, savings machine. I've got this wealth creation machine that's hard at work on my behalf, and the money that I'm earning, you know, my paycheck, I can spend that. Well, we saw a lot of wealth disappear from housing, from stock markets, and over the last year or two, as you know, qualified as the outlook is for the economy, as, as reserved as you know, some of our conversations are going to be about some of the real risks that are still out there, you have know, the stock markets, and again, at least one of the indices, at an all-time high. How do we reconcile those two things? It has a lot to do with the flow of capital. And if there's one thing in our industry that we haven't had a good appreciation for over the course of the last few decades, it's been that it's not just about fundamentals. We can use a pro forma model to think about what drives the valuation of an asset, but if we discount the fact that there's a lot more at play here, and people's 
access to capital, the way that they're chasing after real estate assets, their ability to lever up, that those things also play a role in driving values, we're gonna get it wrong. So we've got values that are going up. A lot of people are making a lot of money. A lot of us are seeing sort of our savings or our wealth levels or our you know, stock portfolios. You know, that, that's all you know, being restored. You know, there's a great turnaround there and we're doing okay. But you know, we know that this is a very divisive discussion. It's a highly political discussion as well. And you know, one of the ways in which it's been characterized is that the liberal misanthropes, which is a fairly strong word, let's just say the Democrats, have said that the rich are getting richer much faster than the poor are getting less poor. Just one way of saying, you know what, this is a rising tide, but it's not lifting all boats. And uh, I don't mean that as a, as a jab at the Democrats. I'm Canadian, far more liberal than any of you. Um, <laughs> what do we have here then? We've got sort of a hunt for yield, but it's not a hunt for yield that's really benefiting everyone. And that's you know, part of what's led to so much discord, so much dysfunction in the policy debate, which, what's made sort of you know, the dinner conversation about politics at the family table a, a fairly difficult one over the course of the last couple of years. And it's troublesome. We think maybe there's some malfeasance, maybe something's going wrong. Someone needs to be going to jail and no one has. Um, so what happens? Well, someone will say the machinery by which Wall Street separates the opportunity to speculate from the unwanted returns and burdens of ownership, you know what, it, it goes beyond clever. It's ingenious, it's precise, and it's almost beautiful. Well, what does that mean for us? It means that we might also be able to say the purpose of all of this financial engineering is to accommodate the speculator and to facilitate speculation. But you know what? That transfer of risk, uh, that manipulation and engineering of market outcomes, that's not something that, you know, for those of us who are in finance, work on, you know, proverbial Wall Street, we can't be too honest and open about that sort of thing. Uh, because if Wall Street uh, confessed uh, this purpose, and I've lost a couple of words here, a lot of people, uh, a lot of uh, moral men and women uh, would have no choice but to condemn Wall Street uh, for nurturing an evil thing and calling for reform. We really understood what was going on. We really understood who was making money off of all of these things. Because it's not necessarily the people who are bearing all of the losses. You know what, if we really had a good idea of that, if everyone came clean, we'd really have to call some folks out. So you know what? What you're doing isn't to the benefit of the country, it's not to the benefit of the economy, it's not in the public interest. Maybe we need to regulate you differently. Maybe there's a different role for you in our society. And that's kind of where we are right now. You know, we've got a newly empowered Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. We've got a Senate Banking Committee uh, that certainly uh, has a lot more gusto uh, now than it did you know, before the most recent round of elections. And uh, you know, I think for a lot of people who may be regional or community bankers, you know, that raises a lot of questions. It can be frustrating at times. What does Dodd-Frank mean for the way in which I conduct my business? If I don't understand what the implications are, in part because legislation as passed is not necessarily precise. The precision comes in the implementation and the execution on that legislation by the meritocracy, by the bureaucracy. And that process isn't complete yet. So you know, that may be playing some role in limiting the way in which capital is able to re-engage in supporting commercial real estate outcomes. But this is kind of where we are right now. Here's the crazy thing. None of those lines, none of that text is actually describing what has happened in Florida or in the United States over the course of the last property boom and bust. It all comes from a book called The Great Crash about what happened in 1929 right here in Florida. So when I say that all of this has happened before and all of this will happen again, it is because we have seen so much of what is happening today happen before. The circumstances, the context, the players, the debates, the language is different today. The policy response is different today from what we observed during the Great Depression, during that great crash. But if you pick up a copy of this book, I'm not pushing the book, um, but if you pick up a copy of this book and read that first chapter, you could be forgiven thinking or feeling a little confused about whether or not this guy was writing about Florida in 1929 or whether he was writing about Florida in 2009. And that is an amazing thing. What it tells us is that there is the possibility that we get 
very smart after a downturn. We think very carefully about the risks that we're taking. We're very cautious about taking those risks. We want to invest time and effort in making sure that we're measuring them, that we're mitigating them better. You know, we're going to go from a place of being very, very nervous to a place of a little bit more confidence because we feel like, you know, we've really learned a very, very tough lesson. And whether we're, you know, the folks who are putting CMBS 3.0 out into the market, or whether we're the folks who are thinking about how to make sure that the loans that we're making today to a residential borrower can be refinanced a little bit down the road. You know, things have changed. Well, what this tells us is that there are some failures in the market. There are some failures in the way in which we think about risk, in which uh, we time risk, in which we think about the potential consequences and costs of our investment behaviors, about the way that different parties to the transaction have different incentives. There is something here that we haven't yet learned fully. And it may not be that we haven't learned it as much as we need to. Part of it is that we come out of the crisis thinking that there has been some fundamental and structural change. We think differently, the world is different now, we've learned our lesson, it won't happen like this again. Well, you know what, it will happen like this again, in part because those changes that we're thinking about, or, you know, that shell shock that we come away with after the Great Recession and the financial crisis and the collapse of so many national institutions, well, that attention to risk, that care that we take in undertaking investment and development and lending, Sure, some of it is structural, but a lot of it is cyclical. And if we don't put structural measures in place to make sure individually as an industry, or God forbid through the regulatory mechanism, that you know, we're just able to do this a little bit better. You know, if we don't make that effort, then whether it's six months from now or six years from now, at some point we're gonna forget to be careful again. And we're gonna go through the same process again. We're going to take risks just like the risks that we've taken and we will experience significant losses. Now, why is that particularly important for us here today? It's part of the reason why when Galbraith was writing this book and describing what happened in 1929, he started by talking about Florida. Some of that boom and bust, some of that speculation and land, some of that notion that, you know what, there's tremendous promise here and I need to capitalize on it. That leads to bigger cycles, more difficult cycles, potentially more profitable cycles here in Florida than in a lot of other parts of the country. Now, why is that? How can that be? In part, it is because at the root of every potential bubble, there is some kernel of truth. There is some value. There is some reason or justification for the investment that we'll make. When we look at the multifamily market today, there are a hundred reasons to want to be an investor in multifamily. Cash flow is rising, rents are going up, vacancy rates are going down, and in a lot of markets, new inventory isn't coming online quickly enough to reverse those gains. There are a lot of good reasons to be there. Does that mean that we don't have segments of the market where some buyers will one day experience a degree of buyer's remorse? Where some lenders will say, you know what, that loan that I made that worked at 3.5% that now needs to be refinanced at 6 or 6.5 or 7%, and gosh, you know what? It doesn't work on an exit. Well, those are the kinds of consequences that are being embedded in some of the choices that we're making today. Because as we get more confident, as we distance ourselves from that moment of crisis, it's important that we feel more confident. It's the thing that ultimately unleashes our entrepreneurial potential, our readiness to invest, to take chances, and to do all of the things that will grow our economy. All of the things that you know, make America the place it is, as you know, we heard a lot about yesterday. But what we also know is that as we re-engage, that potentiality, the possibility that, you know what, we will actually internalize some of what happened during the last cycle in a way that you know, doesn't leave us behind. Isn't just you know, part of the cycle. Something really gets ingrained that allows us to lend, to invest, to develop in a way that allows for the market over time to be more stable, allows for our prospects to be stronger and better. That possibility exists. And now is the opportune moment. Because now is the time where we are either going to decide that we will remember some of the things that happened during the financial crisis and not from that remembrance act out of fear 
or say, you know what, I'm not going to invest, but we'll remember that because it can help to inform the way in which we make decisions as we look forward. So it's happened before and it can happen again. What does that mean for Florida? What is our path to growth in the state? Well, what we know is that you know, given, in part, Florida's dependence on housing, Florida did really well. It's that red line, and it outpaced the national economy during the housing boom. Once housing turned negative, and given this very, very long period over which it has struggled to develop momentum, like the national housing market, it would make sense. It shouldn't come as any surprise. Florida has lagged national trends. We're in pretty good position this year because housing is showing some real signs of improving. We've had false starts in the housing markets plenty of times over the last couple of years. This time around, it looks like, you know what, there are enough indicators that are improving across enough places that people's notion of whether or not they should buy a home might finally be changing. They might finally be saying, you know what, prices are going up, and that is going to be the thing that lures me into the market. The rising price is the thing that gets me to say, you know what, now is the time to buy. Because not only are prices going up, but I know eventually that the mortgages are going to get more expensive as well. So now, when housing affordability is at a historic high, you know what, it's time for me to make that transition to home ownership. You get enough people who start to think about housing differently, who start to say, you know what, this isn't an asset that is going to destroy wealth. This is an asset that has the potential uh, to serve a, a whole variety of purposes. Modest wealth creation at the same time as it, it provides me with access to a whole array of amenities that I want access to. We think about you know, part of the contingent, part of the demographic that has driven some of the new apartment demand in markets around the country. Well, some of that demand is folks who you know what they held off on making a choice to shift tenure from being a renter to one day being a homeowner. They've been waiting for the right time. They don't want to make the largest single investment that they will ever make in their lives only to see that six months down the road, their home is worth less. The likelihood of that happening in the minds of a lot of people, we're turning a corner there. And that's making a big difference to how we think about what will happen in the economy, what will happen in Florida over the course of the next year and over the course of the next couple of years. It's not just that we build a lot of homes here. We have a lot of people employed and trying to trade those homes and broker the sales. It's that Florida benefits enormously from the migration of people from other parts of the country into Florida. It is poised over the next couple of weeks, over the next couple of months, to overtake New York as one of the largest states in the union in terms of its population. And that is because for a lot of people, it is a very, very attractive place. And part of what drives growth here is the fact that people from abroad and from other parts of the country decide that, you know what, Florida is a destination of choice. If anyone else came from New York yesterday, where it was literally 60 degrees colder than it is here, you know what I'm talking about. But what we also know is that when house prices are low, when people's mortgages are hold higher balances than what they think their homes are worth. Not everyone is going to walk away. In fact, most people don't walk away from their homes when they're underwater on their mortgages. But what we know they're not going to be able to do is sell their home, pay off the mortgage, and move. So when home prices are very, very low, what we get is a situation in which mobility of labor, of capital, of households is, is more constrained. And so over the last couple of years, it's not because there's something fundamentally wrong with Florida that fewer people have moved from other parts of the country into the state. It's in part that your ability to leave Chicago, to leave Boston, to leave Philadelphia, to say, you know what, my new destination is going to be Tampa, is going to be Jacksonville, is going to be Fort Lauderdale. Your ability to make that transition, you're somewhat constrained by the fact that you know what, if you sell your house, you still can't pay off your mortgage. That begins to change, and so the implication of a housing turnaround, it's bigger than just building homes in Florida. It facilitates one of the other underpinnings of growth in the state, which is people's ability to migrate across the country. When, in fact, we see over a very, very long period of time, and nothing in the data tells us to change, when people move, a lot of them are gonna show up here. So we've had a slow recovery in Florida, a lot of that ties back into housing. You know, it's a pretty big boom and bust here. And again, it's not just housing, it's not just people moving. There's a third element to this as well, which is that there's a wealth effect. When house prices are going up and people feel that your wealth is being created by that engine, 
They have to save less to meet whatever their long-term savings goals are. So you know what, if my home value, my equity is being built up completely independent of anything else that I do, then that income that I generate from my day job um, is something that I can use to fund current expenditures. I can buy TVs, I can send my kids to college, I can you know, go on a vacation. Well, that works when house prices are going up, but it also works when house prices are going down. So what do we see happening over the course of the last couple of years in Florida and in all of the other states where house prices fell in a very, very significant way? Well, all of a sudden, people are looking at their homes and saying, you know what, that store of wealth, you know, my wealth is being erased. My retirement savings, my nest egg is disappearing before my very eyes. The wealth effect works both ways because in that scenario, people suddenly start to say, you know what, I can't spend every incremental dollar that I earn. That marginal dollar now needs to go into savings because my wealth creation machine, my home, it's broken. It's not working anymore. So people haven't been spending very much. We haven't seen a lot of consumption activity over the course of the downturn in Florida. And that also relates back to housing. So what happens as housing begins to turn around? There's some folks who are going to say, you know what? I don't need to be so careful with that marginal dollar. You know what? That thing that I've been putting off buying, I, I can buy it because you know what? My home value is going up and I feel pretty good about my overall position. There are people who are saying, you know what? I've put off retiring. I've put off you know, making the move to, to Tampa or Orlando. But now that I can sell my home, I, I can actually you know, make that transition. Maybe I'm buying a home in Florida. Maybe I'm going to use the proceeds from the sale of my home uh, to uh, find a, a perfect place for myself at an entry fee CCRC. There are all kinds of dynamics at work that drive strong multiplier effect. When housing starts to improve, it ripples through the economy, and again, not just because we're building more houses. It impacts us in a whole range of ways that are going to be critical for outcomes in Florida over the course of the next couple of years, and are going to be part of the reason why we have the potential in the state over the course of the next couple of years to improve upon the kind of growth experience that we've had in the last couple of years. Now, if you look at the last 12 months, what happened in 2012? There are clearly some sectors of the Florida economy that are already building momentum, that are already driving better outcomes in the state. There are some that you know, over the course of 2012 are, are still lagging, are still exerting drags on the overall economy. What's the biggest driver of growth in the state over the course of the last 12 months? Well, at least in terms of how quickly that labor pool was able to grow, it was hospitality. It was people working in hotels, it was people working in restaurants, it was people working at theme parks. And those jobs were created in part because in 2012, Florida had its best year ever in terms of the number of tourists who came to visit. They're not just from other parts of the country, they're coming from all around the world as well. More people come to the state, they're spending money here in a way that is resulting in tangible improvements in the kind of economic outcomes we're seeing in that segment of the market. Do we want to be just a state that you know, depends on tourism for economic activity? Over the long run, that's not going to create a sufficiently dynamic economy. We've had growth in professional and business services as well. We've had growth in trade and utilities, education and health. Those are some of the things that we've seen grow in other parts of the country as well. Education, health, you know, the connections there are obvious. They grow and are related in part to demographics more than they're related to anything that's going on with the economic cycle. Particularly when we have entitlement programs designed the way they are, when we make student loans available the way that we do, all of that is designed to make sure that you know, even if times are tough out there, people can still afford or still have the opportunity to get a college education. So education and health, like in other parts of the country, you know, those are sectors that have been doing really well. Non-farm overall in Florida, grew employment over last year by 0.7%. It's not a spectacular number. When we see those national numbers come out, we see that you know, we created 150,000 jobs last month, 160,000 jobs last month, and people are impressed or the markets rally, it's only because of context. 150,000 jobs being created in this economy is not enough. It is not going to help us build up a higher rate of labor participation. It's not gonna mean that we have more people generating value in the economy, paying taxes, to then help support all of the obligations that we have at the same time. And it is a real problem now. For all the focus that we have on the unemployment rate, it is probably the most misleading measure that we've got of what's going on in the labor market. 
Part of the reason it has gone down is because we have lost people in the labor force. The labor force participation rate is lower than, I think, what we'll see in the data. It's ever been, at least during the period where we've been keep, keeping records. We'll have to make some corrections in the data for the increased participation of women in the labor force. Once we make that adjustment, I think what we'll see is that, you know what, we've never had such a large share of our population not working. And if we have the unemployment rate going down, sure, we're creating some jobs. But it's also because we have people who are saying, you know what, I'm giving up. Now, that's a curious thing. And it leads to a whole other discussion around why it is that over the last couple of recessions, we have seemingly lost the capacity to recover jobs very quickly. There was a time where as we emerged from a recession, as we started to observe growth again in the economy, that also meant that we were creating jobs and that people were getting back to work. And from the time that we started losing jobs, it wasn't very long before we had recovered all of the jobs that we had lost. Not the same jobs, but on a count basis, we put people back to work. Over the last couple of recessions, a bunch of us are going to remember the downturn of 2001 and what we characterized as the jobless recovery that followed because for another three years, we weren't consistently creating net new jobs in the economy. This time around has been much, much tougher. If 150,000 sounds good, again, it's only in context because we lost so many. It's not where we need to be. And it requires then that whether in Florida or in any other part of the country, we've got to ask some serious questions. Are there things going on in the policy environment that might be inhibiting job growth? Is it perhaps because when home values are low, people aren't able to start small businesses? You sort of you scratch your head and say, well, what's the connection there? If you look at entrepreneurship in America, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of stylized facts, it's not only true during election campaigns that most of the new jobs in the country are created by small businesses. That is true all of the time. Um, it's also true that most of the job losses come from small businesses. You know, not all of them survive. But where we have the potential to create new value, to do something new, to do something entrepreneurial, to you know, embrace all of the opportunity that our economic freedom gives us in this country, it's going to be with those small businesses saying, you know what, I have an idea. And there's no other place where I might be able to monetize that idea as well as I might be able to monetize it here. Well, here's the challenge. How do people finance that? Most of those entrepreneurs are not getting small business administration loans. Most entrepreneurship, most small business creation in the United States, folks are paying for that out of their home equity. They're getting home equity lines of credit and they're using that money to pay to build small businesses. If you don't have access to that home equity, everything we see in the data tells us that, you know what, you might be able to find some other sources of financing, but for at least some people, it's going to inhibit their ability to say, well, I'm going to do something new. I'm going to take a risk. I am going to build something that no one has thought of before, that is going to be the next thing that drives meaningful job growth in our economy. We're constrained in being able to do that when the housing market is weak because we depend on that equity to be able to finance all of those things that we want to do. And so again, we have the situation where housing matters a lot. Housing matters so much more than just the homes we're building. That's going to be critical for us again in Florida because it's been a tough slog in Florida because of what's happened with housing. As housing begins to improve, the potential for us to seize upon the opportunity that creates if we do other things right, you know, there's a lot of potential there. We have to do a whole bunch of other things right. We may have access to capital in the form of home equity lines of credit. We have to make sure that the environment is conducive to people being ready to say, you know what, I'm going to start that small business. I'm going to take that risk. I'm going to be productive in an environment that, you know what, is supportive of my setting something new up and trying to bring it to market. If we make the investments in infrastructure and education and the workforce that allow those small businesses to be successful, well, it's not just the money that you can withdraw from your home equity line. It's that you're in an environment where, you know what, you can put that money to work. So we need to do more than just see house prices go up, but if we get it right, we could see strong growth. We could see meaningful growth. We could see that we not only recoup the losses from the recession, but we do more than that. So we've lost jobs in a lot of areas. We continue to lose jobs in government. There are a lot of people who aren't going to bemoan the fact that we continue to lose jobs in financial services. They'll say, you know, that's part of a great reckoning. Um, we're losing jobs to government. That is also something that will exert less of a drag on the economy in 2013 than it did in 2012. 
And there's a reason for that. It's not true everywhere. I know that there's some folks from Chicago who will be able to tell you that in terms of its balance sheet, in terms of its public finances, Illinois is in terrible shape. That means higher taxes on businesses, on individuals, on property, in a way that, you know what, if you're thinking about where you're gonna base your new company, the fact that you face a significantly higher tax burden in Illinois and aren't getting anything for it because it's just being used to fund unfunded pension obligations, well, that creates a very, very difficult dynamic. We're a very mobile country when house prices start to rise, and if you could be anywhere, you're not going to locate into the highest cost tax jurisdiction. So there's a tough situation there. We're better off in Florida. Not to say that like every other state, we don't have issues here, we don't face challenges around the way that we'll meet obligations uh, that come right along with our entitlement programs. But in terms of the funding of our pension obligations, of our healthcare obligations, of all of the things that we've promised to state employees, to teachers, we've done a better job of that here than we've done in a lot of other places in the United States. And that's part of why, you know, after a couple of years of very, very deep cuts, you know, the governor is actually in a position to say, you know what, whether it's creative accounting or whether it's very, very real, uh, there's a little bit of extra money there. And I'm going to invest it in a way that I think will help to encourage growth. I'm going to put teachers back to work. I'm going to invest in our universities. I'm going to make sure that you know, we're not only depending on people moving to Florida, but we are growing right here at home a pool of high-skill labor that can meet the demands of a new and much more creative workforce than what we've seen historically. So we've got these losses. Construction will be less of a loss as well, in part because you know, there are parts of the market, there are places where there is an opportunity to start building again. Uh, we don't want to get carried away with that, but there are parts of the country, there are markets, there are some markets. If you're from Miami, apparently it's you know, more than just one sub-market. Um, but there's a lot of building activity, and there is opportunity to do that. And you think about through this issue around skills matching and flexibility or inflexibility in the workforce. There are a lot of jobs out there that are going unfilled right now. In San Jose, you're going to get high technology companies that are saying, you know what, I need to go to Washington to lobby for higher visa caps because I need to be able to bring labor in from other parts of the world because I don't have enough qualified programmers in the labor pool here in the United States. You'll find folks in North Dakota who are fracking for shale, who are gonna say, you know what, in this case, it's not so much about skill, there's a spatial issue. I can't get people here. They don't want to come, or if they do come, I don't have anywhere to put them. We've seen such a surge in employment and the need for people here, there isn't enough multifamily housing to go around. That's not to say that you should build multifamily housing in North Dakota. It's a volatile market. It's a market that depends on one good, or one commodity, or one industry. That's potentially troublesome. Um, but it's hard to get people there. And there are jobs that are going unfilled in an area of the economy that has the potential to be one of the drivers of growth as we think about something that would have been inconceivable five or six or seven years ago, which is that North America, in our lifetimes, may be energy independent. Maybe not energy independent in a pure sense, but energy secure, a hell of a lot more secure than we were thinking about five or six or seven years ago when the technology and the cost of you know, extracting gas was much, much higher than what we think it's going to look like today. So we have jobs that are going unfilled, but we know that we have a lot of people that don't have jobs. The unemployment rate is very, very high. And again, because the unemployment rate is a bad measure, if we combine that with the fact that labor force participation is so low, what we begin to see is there are a lot of people who aren't working. Think about some of the industries that have been hardest hit. Now, the best example for any one of us is gonna be construction. There are a lot of people that have been displaced in the construction sector. Think about that discussion and contrast it with the debate that we have about skills matching and labor force flexibility. If you have been a drywall for the last 10 years or 20 years, and that's what you know how to do, you can't just one day decide that you're going to write code for Google. That is a little bit harder to do than for you know, what we might you know, think to ourselves and sort of you know, the more academic discussion. But the ability of our labor force to retool itself in an environment and in an age where almost any job requires some level of skill that's higher than what it would have been when we thought about the kinds of jobs that we created in the economy 30 or 40 or 50 years ago. Well, every job needs skill. Those skills take time and are costly to acquire. 
And so our labor force is going to be less flexible or appear less flexible in part just because it's harder to go from being a construction worker to being a brain surgeon or, you know, I suppose you could just stop halfway and be an economist and you'd be able to pull that off very, very easily. So what do we have? We have a, a situation where you know, we've got a fairly mixed picture with job creation, but some of the drags on job creation in Florida over the course of last year are going to ease a little bit for us. It's going to get better in terms of you know, construction, in terms of government. Maybe finance will even level out over the course of the next 12 months. This is, of course, a baseline. Are there things that could go wrong in the economy? Absolutely. We only need to look at sort of the day-to-day -day discussion around the sequestration. We only need to look at what's happening in Europe and the potential for a deterioration in European outcomes to spill over into the United States. There are all sorts of things that could happen. I'd venture to say that there are more potential wild cards uh, now than we've ever seen before. Whether it relates to policy dysfunction and the inability of our legislators to actually make progress on the issues that are determinative of whether or not we can grow the economy and make investment decisions, or whether it's because of external influences that we have no control over. You know, all of those things are potential wild cards that could take us off of this baseline path. And we have to be prepared for that. It's part of our risk management and assessment. What we do know is that along that baseline, some pieces are, are, are coming together. It's not going to seem like it every day. If you're worried about the sequestration, and you also happen to have heard that Congress has recessed and everyone's left, so it doesn't look like we'll get any kind of movement. There just aren't enough people left on Capitol Hill to pass any kind of legislation between now and next week. Well, sure, there are things that could you know, mess with our plans. Uh, but uh, what we know is that once we get beyond some of those things, once we can see that, you know what, the policy environment is a drag on the economy. It's a drag on our ability to make well-informed decisions about how we're going to invest. And you know what? At least for the foreseeable future, that may not change. We can hope it'll change, but the sequestration debate is a little absurd. Because when we think about the kinds of cuts we need to make to balance the budget over the long term, not tomorrow, five years from now, 10 years from now, 20 years from now, it's pretty obvious what we need to do. And the political will to do it simply doesn't exist. There's no rocket science. There's only a few things that we spend money on at the federal level. I can tell you this, it's a fairly blunt way of putting it. Let's say that we decided in Washington that the only things that the US government was going to do from now on were to fight and pay for our wars and to make transfers to old people. We would still not be able to balance our budget. We do not have enough money in discretionary spending that we could close that gap. Once you account for the fact that we've accumulated a lot of debt and as interest rates go up, the cost of servicing that debt gets much, much higher than anything that we see going on today. What do we need to do? There are good ideas out there. None of them are surprises. The political will to do them doesn't exist. So maybe we simply accept the fact that, you know, we live in this environment of exaggerated uncertainty. It's not going to go away tomorrow. We're going to take that uncertainty and we're going to say, you know what, in that environment where maybe some other people hesitate in making a choice, in making an investment, in you know, breaking ground on a new product, maybe we can turn that to our advantage. Maybe it's something that we've just learned to work around, we've learned to live with. Um, there isn't a better choice for a lot of people right now. If you're going to wait until Washington is working like a well-oiled machine, we'll have to talk again next year. So, there are people coming to Florida. This is a big part of Florida's growth and recovery story right now. The blue bars here show us folks that are coming to visit Florida, go to Disney World, go to Universal Studios, um, from other parts of the country. The red piece, folks who are coming from Canada, that number's been growing. Um, in part, it's gotten easier for them because their dollar's worth a lot. It's worth a lot more than it was just a couple of years ago makes the US vacation a lot more affordable than it was. So you've got folks coming from Canada, and that green bar, those are folks coming from all these other countries. And you know what? It's not the places that you might think of. After Canada, the next big contributor to tourism in Florida is Brazil. It's not Mexico, it's not the UK, it's Brazil. There are people coming from all sorts of places. And they're sometimes coming to buy condos, sometimes they're coming just because their kids want to go to Disney. So you've got visitors. You can see the relationships changing in terms of the mix of those visitors, but there are a lot of people coming here, and that is driving that growth in leisure and hospitality employment that has really led the pack in terms of where we've been able to put people back to work. We need to seize the opportunity to say, you know what, we have a very high quality workforce here. We have a very high quality of living. 
right here in Orlando, and all the way over to Tampa, we've got a Central Florida high-tech corridor that has extraordinary untapped potential. And if we can find the right way to leverage the resources that we have at our disposal, you know what, it's not that we need to brush housing aside, it's that we can be much, much more than an economy that's driven by housing and tourism. And that, if anything, is going to be critical to our success and our ability to say, you know what, our prospects are brighter than they've ever been. We're more than just the things that have grown our economy in 1928 and 29 or in 2004 and 2005. Tourism matters, and what we're going to see is all of these forces are important, but they're all playing out in different ways. Not every city in Florida is exactly the same. We know that. Uh, folks who don't visit Florida as often may not. Um, where are populations changing? Where do we see growth? Those red areas, unfortunately, those are areas that have actually lost population over the course of the last couple of years. The areas in blue and white, those are areas that have been able to pick up people over the last couple of years. That pattern will begin to change again because we've had a fairly tough period over the last couple of years. There have been as many people making the move to Florida as we've seen historically. That depends on housing. People begin to come back. What else do we have? Where are those people coming from? Well, Florida is actually in a fairly neat position. You know, folks will talk about how you know Florida isn't seeing the kind of in-migration now that it saw a decade ago or two decades ago. That kind of north-south movement, that sort of secular shift of where people want to be. You know, Florida doesn't have that kind of attractiveness today that it did you know, a decade ago or a generation ago. Perhaps not. There are a lot of other choices for where people can go now. But Florida does have something. It's still bringing in more people than every other state in the union, except for California and Texas. And you know what, in fact, has a more balanced appeal. When we look at where the people are coming from, Texas is the only other state in the union where we're not only getting people coming from other parts of the country, but we're getting people from other parts of the world. There is no other state that might be able to say the same thing except for Texas. Folks from abroad love California, but if they live in California already, all they want to do is leave. Um, you've got lots of other states. New York, I mean, we're a melting pot. People arriving in New York every day. If you've lived in New York for a couple of years, all you want to do is leave. So we've got a situation where there might be sort of disparate or offsetting drivers of growth. Very few places where we can say in a meaningful way, real numbers, there are people showing up across the board. But we have that in Florida in a way that we can leverage better than we're leveraging now. Demographics mean also that you know, we've got changing patterns in terms of the kinds of people who are moving to state, the kinds of things that they're looking for, the kind of product that we need to provide when we're developing multifamily, retail, uh, you know, office space. There are parts of the country, the areas marked in blue here, or parts of the state that are marked in blue here, but the, the median age of a Floridian is over 45 years old. That's a, that's a pretty experienced group. Um, we've also got parts of the state that uh, are demonstrated you know, a, a real sort of youthful vigor. There is a little spot right there in the middle that I think most of us will be able to identify. That's Gainesville right there. So we've got sort of this real mix here. And being able to then say, you know what, there are differing patterns here. When people come to Florida, they come for different reasons and they locate to different places because of those different reasons. That means that we need to be sensitive to the kind of product that we're developing, but you know what? If we get the product matched up right to the people who are showing up to demand it, we can do better than we're doing now. Unemployment rates, they're starting to come down. They're still you know, far too high. We're going to see that begin to improve, particularly as we get construction workers back on the job. That's been sort of a real Achilles heel for Florida. We're more dependent on housing than most other states, and so when housing's not performing well, we've got a lot of construction workers that simply don't have a lot of other options for how they might engage in the workforce. So that unemployment rate begins to come down as housing markets begin to stabilize as well. Construction employment, again, you can see parts of the state that have been hardest hit in the housing downturn being some of the places where we've got the highest concentrations of construction employment, but where, as a consequence, we've also got you know, this pretty tough combination low house prices, losses of value in home prices, and, and people who aren't generating the kind of incomes they need to make their mortgage payments. That's a, that's a very vicious cycle, but it's one that we're beginning to see that we might be able to turn the corner on. 
So we've got all these different drivers. And what I suggest here again is that, you know what, all of those things that have been traditional drivers of growth in Florida, some of them aren't as strong as they used to be. Some of them will be stronger than they have been historically. Just look at the demographics of the United States. It's not as if we're going to stop seeing people show up here. What we know, though, is that there's a lot of potential. Again, we have a low cost of living, high quality of living, uh, a well-educated, high-skilled workforce, people who are ready to work hard, young people. If we can find a way to unleash that entrepreneurial talent, and you know what, not just create high-skill labor, but find good ways of keeping them here in the state after they graduate from their respective programs, there's a lot of potential to say, you know what, Florida is just as much about high tech, it's just as much about pharmaceuticals, it's just as much about all of these other things that we think of as being so critical in driving a creative economy, a creative class. When we think about what kind of world we'll live in 30 or 40 or 50 years from now, what will be the dominant industries, which cities will be superstars, and which cities will, will struggle. The ones that can develop and invest and provide the right environment to nurture their creative class, those are the ones that are going to succeed. That's what the data is telling us right now. And so we have to find a better way of doing that. We have to make the state more attractive to people that we train to be high skilled. So you know what? We didn't only train you here. We've got something for you to do here in Florida. Keep them here. Let's see what they can do as house prices begin to rise. So what's a prescription for growth in Florida? Encourage stable housing outcomes. That means that you know, we want housing to be improving, but that might also mean that when housing gets ahead of itself, we've got to find clever ways of managing uh, a housing market that you know, might be fomenting a bubble. It's happened before, it'll happen again. We've got to find a way of saying, you know, we need housing, we want housing, we want it to be more stable, we want it to get better. But there are going to be parts of the market, there are going to be times where housing gets too hot in a way that will hurt us in the long run. And figure out how it is that we're going to manage around that. We need to invest in small business, in education. We need to grow and retain that high skill workforce. That's going to allow us to then say, you know what, there's more going on here than all the traditional drivers of growth in the state. We need to keep Florida attractive. So remember, the other underpinning of growth here is that people show up, whether it's because they are here on holiday or whether it's because they come here to move and live. People are coming to Florida and their arrival, and the money and the skills and the ideas that they bring with them, whatever stage, of their household life cycle they're in. You know, those are big contributors to growth. So we need to make sure that we're doing the right things, investing in infrastructure, adopting you know, smart tax policies, uh, whether it's property taxes, income taxes, uh, providing the right kinds of programs and amenities at the public level that ultimately make Florida, or help keep Florida the attractive place that it's always been. We need to run government very lean and very smart. We're in a much more mobile world we're in a world where, you know what, if a tax jurisdiction taxes you too high relative to the benefits you get from locating there, you're going to move somewhere else. We see this in cities and states all around the country. New York can have a 5% or thereabouts wage tax on people who live in the city. Live in the city, an extra 5% of my income just goes on an income tax to, uh, to New York. And you know what, the benefit I get from living in New York in terms of my proximity to work, the agglomeration, uh, my ability to interact with other people, some of the things that Professor Glazer talked about yesterday, there's so much value in being located there that you can impose that tax. And the cost-benefit analysis for me works very, very well, and it does for a lot of people. In Philadelphia, we've got a wage tax that's somewhere between 4 and 5%. The agglomeration in Philadelphia isn't quite as strong. The benefit that you get from locating in Center City isn't quite as strong. And the ability of the city then to put that kind of tax in place and hold on to its taxpayers is much more limited. And what did we see happen over the course of a couple of decades in Philadelphia when they weren't thinking carefully and smartly about tax policy? Well, if you tax people and aren't giving them some benefit in return, they're going to leave. And they left Center City Philadelphia in a big way, in a way that was transformative and not for the better for downtown Philly. That is a critical issue here. We're on a pretty good path so far with the governor, choices that have been made over the course of several administrations in terms of how it is that we manage public finances. Given that one of the major challenges for our country over the course of the next few decades is not just going to be managing public finances better at the federal level, but also doing it 
better in a more sound, sustainable way at the local level, at the level of the state. And think about, well, how is it that we can provide good quality education in a way that we can afford? How is it that we can provide good quality healthcare services in a way that we can afford? How is it that we are going to address the infrastructure crisis that we can see in almost every corner of our country? Well, we need to be able to do that in a way that we can afford. That you know what, we're putting our money to use efficiently when we tax people a dollar, we're putting that dollar to work in a way that they say, you know what, it makes sense to be here. It makes sense for me to pay that dollar and I'm gonna stay public. Because if we get that wrong, people will leave. So we've gotta run government smart. It means a lot of different things. It means e-fairness, which I think is just more efficient tax policy with you know, how we impose sales taxes on sales that occur online versus sales that are made in bricks and mortar stores. It's not gonna be something that's going to change the world for bricks and mortar retailers. They still all have to develop new ideas for how they're going to monetize their bricks and mortar channel and how it is that they're going to leverage their access to the internet and the ability of people to then acquire goods and services through online channels. But this fundamental imbalance in the way that we have implemented taxes in the United States on the purchases of goods and services means that we introduce a significant inefficiency. We reduce the productivity of our economy because there are going to be some things that can be provided more efficiently, more cost effectively through bricks and mortar, but it appears as if they can be provided and offered more efficiently through online channels because you've got a tax in one place and you don't have a tax in the other. So the efficient outcome disappears. It's distorted by the fact that we have this differential implementation policy. It's not even about fairness, it's about making sure that the economy works right. So a lot to do here. We've also got to then say, you know, we're going to do all of this. We're going to run the state right. We're going to make the right investments in young people and you know, the students at the Bergstrom Center in ways that help to drive the productive capacity of the economy. But we've also got to do an environment where we're mindful of the fact that we live in a bigger world and that bigger world isn't working as well as it could. So where does that put us? Well, what's the context of growth? Our expectation on my team, we're going to see fairly modest growth over the next couple of years. These are better numbers, GDP growth, inflation picking up a little bit, unemployment coming down, than we've seen for a while. Is this growth that is consistent with our growth potential? It's not. There are lots of things that are limiting our ability or are constraining us in our being able to reach our potential. It doesn't look like we're going to get the answers to those drags right away, but we're starting to see some real improvements. Now, one of the potential challenges is that we know that you know, our economy has you know, been goosed uh, by uh, Federal Reserve uh, interventions. We know that you know, the Fed has had its lead foot on monetary policy since the beginning of the financial crisis. And if housing matters a lot, the fact that the Fed is spending $85 billion every month to buy assets, about half treasuries and about half mortgage-backed securities, that's what's keeping mortgage rates low. We still do have a challenge here. We've got to realize, you know what, if we believe that the Fed should be intervening, that all this low interest policy makes sense, it's because you know, we realize that you know, maybe the economy still doesn't have its own momentum. Maybe we wouldn't have a housing recovery in the way that we're starting to see it now if it were the case that interest rates were a little bit higher. It'd be hard to see how prices would be going up or maybe it would even be at the levels that they're at today if mortgage rates were seven or eight percent instead of three and a half or four percent. And for those of us who were in the housing market in the mid-1980s, you know, our students today wouldn't believe that we actually bought homes when our mortgages were 17 or 18 percent. They just wouldn't understand. In those times, even after you adjusted for inflation, if the real mortgage rate were anything like what it is today, you wouldn't be able to keep houses on the shelves. They would be flying off in every direction and we'd be worrying about the housing market overheat. So there's something still not working exactly right. Fed policy matters, and the Federal Reserve has flexibility to say, you know what, we're going to be accommodated because we don't have strong inflation in the US economy right now. That is allowing us to say, you know, we're gonna do some things that we know exactly how they work and you know, the channels through which they're going to impact economic outcomes. We're gonna try some things that maybe are less well understood. But we're in an environment where absent strong inflationary pressures, if we can experiment a little bit. They're not gonna characterize it that way. So what are gonna be the growth drivers in 2013, late 2013? Consumers, we think, are gonna be stronger growth drivers than they were in 2012. Now, not right now. I mean, a lot of people are internalizing uh, the expiration of the payroll tax cut. For a lot of families, maybe 2% of your income 
But when you look at how much of your income is discretionary, where you say, you know what, I'm going to spend this, or I'm going to save it, or I'm going to do any of a number of things with it, that 2% of your gross is a lot of money. So there are a lot of people that need to internalize that, and that's going to make for a tough couple of quarters. Eventually, consumers will pick up in part because home values are going up. Housing will be a better contributor, a bigger contributor to economic outcomes in 2013 than it was in 2012. Business is more mixed. Small business is getting better in part because of that access to financing, in part because those small businesses are eliciting or exhibiting a greater degree of confidence in some of their decision making now than they were a year ago or two years ago. Fiscal situation continues to exert a drag on the economy. It's weak, we don't see any resolution around that, it's still gonna be really challenging. Monetary policy is gonna weaker support for growth, in part because interest rates are already starting to go up. It's not because the Fed is necessarily gonna back away, so they have incomplete control over the long end of the yield curve. That long end is what's gonna matter for a lot of us when we're thinking about how it is that we're gonna finance our properties, and those rates are gonna to start to rise in a way that means that, you know what, all of a sudden, there are going to be some apartment assets where the three and a half cap rate doesn't make as much sense as it did when the treasury yield was 1.6 or 1.7. The international environment is a mixed bag. Let's suppose that sequestration happens. Quick question, how much time do I have left, if any? Five minutes or so? Thank you. So suppose sequestration happens. There is a reason that this policy or this idea was brought to the table in the first place. You will have no shortage of people in the next couple of weeks on the news and in the papers who are going to tell you about how terrible it is, how the cuts across the board are not the sensible way to make cuts, how it will you know, devastate payrolls and expenditures and really hurt the economy at the wrong time. That's the idea. It was supposed to be painful. It was supposed to be bad. It was supposed to be tough because folks were looking at the situation and saying, you know what? We are not able to work this out. We are not able to come to agreement. We are not able to do the things that we know we need to do. So let's put a doomsday scenario in front of us because we know that, gosh, we can't let that happen. It's going to force us to figure this out. They didn't figure it out. Whether you believe that we should actually just let this happen or not kind of depends on whether you think that if you give them another chance, they'll figure it out. They know what to do, you know, when they come back from their current recess, maybe they'll finally say, you know what, we're going to work together and we're going to solve this problem in a way that is permanent. If you believe that, then maybe, you know, we should delay sequestration. If you think that, you know what, this isn't the best solution, but we've got a serious long-term problem and the good solution is not one that they're willing to run with, they know what it is. They haven't been able to pick up that ball. They haven't, you know, jumped on that opportunity. So, you know what, maybe the only option that's left on the table is to say, you know what, this isn't a great plan, but if this is the only way that we can restore fiscal balance in the long run to our country and make sure that we're viable as an economy for the next generation, then maybe we take the hard way out. And there are a lot of people in Washington now who I would suggest are thinking exactly that way. Where will the money come from? A lot of it comes out of defense. A lot of it comes out of non-defense discretionary. That gray chunk right there, that's how much we're gonna save just in interest from you know, cutting $1.2 trillion out of the debt over the next 10 years. Gives you an idea of the fact that this situation is actually gonna get a little bit tougher. A couple of years from now, when interest rates are higher, our ability to service our debt is going to be weakened. Every dollar of tax revenue that we take in at the federal level, a larger share of that dollar is going to have to go to make interest payments on things that we've already done instead of making productive investments in our economy like building bridges and opening schools. So that's a challenge for us that we've got to get wrap our hands around right now. What are the chart on the left mean? It means that if we allow for the debt to continue escalating along its current trajectory, that blue bar on the left, you know, we're going to see stronger economic growth than if we make some cuts in 2014. Look ahead 10 years, the fact that we've accumulated that much debt that needs to be serviced means that long run, you know, we're actually taking the wind out of our economy. We're going to grow more slowly in the long run if we do not do this. It's not that we're gonna default on our debt, it's that we are less efficient in our system of public finance and taxation. We've gotta take all of that money and we're not building bridges, we're just paying interest. And that overwhelms our ability to do all sorts of other things in a way that hurts our economic potential. So we can let our deficit rise and it's gonna hurt us. If we make some cuts now, they will hurt and different people will internalize those costs in different ways. There will be real personal costs in some cases, but 
It's going to be something that in the long run will actually help to grow our economy. So maybe we can try and find a way to do it where we minimize some of the pain that needs to be internalized. I have probably another 20 slides, but I have no time. So, <laughs> what I'm going to do is to tell you that my big takeaway in all of this is that uh, we see some, some modest and improving pace of growth in the economy over the course of the next couple of years. Are there wild cards out there? Yeah, and a lot of them are political. Can't put any kind of statistical probability to that. What we also know is that you know, one of the real things that has characterized our recovery, one of the you know, defining features of uh, the commercial real estate market over the course of the last five or six years has been our ability to access extraordinarily low cost capital. That is not the new normal. And one of the big challenges for all of us as we begin to adjust to an economy that firms, that grows in a way that is more robust over the course of the next year, over the course of the next two years, is that we are going to have to internalize the fact that interest rates begin to rise, our costs of financing begin to rise. That exerts upper pressure on not only financing costs, but cap rates in a way that demands that we grow NOI much more quickly than we are today if we are to hold value in our assets. Are we prepared for that? The biggest risk that we see today in the market is that we are underpricing that risk. We are thinking about the current interest rate environment today as the new normal, and we're not thinking carefully enough about how we will run our businesses and how we will succeed in an economy that functions like an economy should. Thank you very much.